I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about origami, React.js, responsive hero images, and more. Let's check it out. First up is origami. Now we've talked about this on the show before. This is basically a prototyping framework from Facebook to allow you to quickly come up with ideas for mobile apps, for their interfaces, how they animate, how you click on different things or tap on different things rather and move through the interface. If, if we came up with these ideas together, would we call it our origami? Anyway, origami just hit version 2.0 and there's this wonderful post about what's new. Well, specifically, Origami Live is a new feature. So now you can make edits to your prototype and you can instantly see the results on an actual device. So you can see that high fidelity prototype and kind of get an idea of the look and feel. Secondly is code export. So this is pretty cool. You can go to this code export menu item and then choose iOS, Android, or web and bam, your app is all done. No, not quite. Actually, it just exports some of the animation code and layout code that you'll need for actually recreating these in the actual application, but still very useful for the developers if they want to take an animation that's already been created in the prototype and just quickly recreate it by copying and pasting some code. You can go ahead and do that now. So this is pretty boring. Let me see if I can find an actual example of origami here. There we go. And with origami, you can create examples like this, and there's even more of them. So they've got the Slinkin Park example. That's pretty cool. We've got 2D Waggle, 3D Waggle. I don't know who came up with these names, but uh, I'm kind of digging it. Yeah, they were on a roll. There's also Tap to Zoom, long press preview. So all sorts of kind of design patterns that maybe you've only seen in some apps or other apps and not necessarily just built into iOS or built into Android. So pretty cool that they have a lot of these examples here so you can see some of the things that origami can do. Anyway, that's that's pretty much that's pretty much it for origami. I mean if you're uncomfortable sharing credit you could just call it your origami. Nope, that's called uh, origami, actually. Next up, we have a, pro uh, sorry, not a project, an article on React tips and best practices. Now, we've talked about React.js here on the show before, and this can be a bit of a complicated library when you get to need a lot of performance. So this person has had a, a lot of experience writing React, and over the last year, they say they have written, refactored, and rewritten many components, and have gone through and and seen some best practices and anti-patterns emerge. And luckily for all of us, they have documented their experiences. So first things first, using the pure render mix-in will keep all of your components up to date when the properties or state changes. This will let you not do all sorts of code like this throughout your React components. Instead, you will just be able to use this render mixin and not notice that as a problem. Now, he also goes into different things like using different property types and avoiding state is a really big one. Now, um, this is, he says, a mantra that holds true to all of programming and React components are no exception. Even though React gives you facilities to work with state, you should still avoid it. Now, you can do different things to avoid it, like not calling set state as much or using component did mount. Anyway, try and keep the state up to date. Also, keep your state in one spot. And there's a really complicated example of what happens inside of a React component with different states. So you have one central store for your state, render it, and then all sorts of triangles and circles and arrows happen, and wow. it goes back to the central store. Is this precipitation or a web app? Uh, wow, you're right. That is the exact example of yeah. precipitation. Oh, I get it. It's a joke about being in the cloud. Yeah. 
all sorts of in the cloud. So that's about all we're going to say from this article. If you'd like to read more in depth on how to use React effectively, check out this link in the show notes, which you can find below the video. Very cool stuff. Well, next up is a wonderful blog post on the Cloud 4 blog called Responsive Hero Images by Jason Grigsby. And well, first, what are hero images? That would be any image of you or I on a web page, right? That is absolutely correct. Although it also is often known as just sort of a marketing image. So this is an example from Target. And here's a couple of other examples. They're basically just large images with text or a call to action on top of them. You've probably seen these before. It's a very common design pattern. Well, how do you make these practical? How do you make these responsive? And it, the answers are actually surprisingly complex. It's not super easy to come up with a perfect photo, figure out exactly where the text is going to go on top of it, and get the colors just right, and then also make all of that responsive. You have to move the text around to, you know, maybe darker parts of the image if it's brighter text, and then you have to get into art direction and all sorts of stuff. It's actually kind of tricky. So the solution that Jason Grigsby came up with here is to let the text determine the breakpoints. So first, you kind of resize the text in the browser that you actually want to have on the page. And then you let that determine how you're going to break things up, how you're going to maybe art direct different things. But there's a number of different approaches to how this can work. And this is just one of them that I think is pretty good. But there's also a couple of them that they point out. And yeah, it's, it's pretty cool stuff. It's actually more complex than you would think it would be. I guess, you know, if you implement this well, you could be considered the hero of your agency. Next up, we have a project called Plur or, or Plier. This is a, an HTML5 media player with custom controls and web VTT captions. This is what it looks like. You can see we've got a video and some little custom controls on the bottom. This all looks really, really nice. Wow, it yeah. does look nice. I I do not hate the player. Do you hate the game? I don't know what you're talking about. Don't hate the player, hate the game? Not ringing a bell. It's a game that's got you all twisted, Nick. Anyway, let's go check out the documentation for Plur, which you can find over on the GitHub. Uh, th why did they create this? Well, they wanted a lightweight, accessible, and customizable media player that just supports modern browsers. Note that modern is italicized, denoting that that is all they want to support. So this is accessible, lightweight, and customizable. It's only 4.8 kilobytes minified and gzipped. So it has an easy to use API that you can get behind. And then also it only loads one SVG sprite for the controls that we saw earlier. And they even show you how to asynchronously load this just before the body. And then if you want to create a video player, this is all of the markup that it takes, including a fallback to a poster if the browser does not support playing that particular type of video. And same thing for audio. There's also some documentation on taking into account cross-origin request vulnerabilities. And here, here's what you've been waiting for, the JavaScript settings that you can use to set it up. You can control the HTML, whether or not the player is enabled, set the volume, and do a ton of different things. So if you are looking for a modern video plur to use in your websites, check this one out. Very nice stuff. I like it a lot. So next up is Fonts in Use. And this is a website that shows you what fonts are being used in different websites, different pieces of advertising, just maybe popular stuff that you might have seen around the internet, like, oh, I don't know, the Trio Show. And then it tells you what font that they're actually using. So for example, if we look at the new Pebble Time OS here, they are using this font called Raster Gothic. Now, hmm, where have I seen Raster Gothic before? Probably on the previous Pebble OS. Let me see if I can actually get there. Ah, yes, there we go. So Raster Gothic in use. Oh. You were right. 
there it is once again. So you can browse by different industries. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. You can go to formats or a lot of stuff. you can just browse by typefaces and you can say, well, I know that I want to use maybe Rockwell, but I want to see how other people have used Rockwell in the past and you can kind of get an idea of where it's been used. So anyway, pretty cool stuff. Very cool for checking out fonts that you like. Design inspiration. Exactly. And figure out how exactly you can best utilize those fonts. Yeah. And then if you don't like one, you can just say, oh, that's not my type face. Exactly. Well, that's all we have time for this week. Thank goodness. I am at NickRP on Twitter. And I am at Jay Cipher. For more information on anything we talked about, check out the show notes right below this video. Thanks so much for watching, and we will see you next week. Thank you.